Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of We Need to Talk. My guest today shot to fame in the 90s, getting her start in the pop culture hit movie Clueless. She then went on to star in TV shows such as Beverly Hills 90210, Clueless the TV series, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Today we're going to be talking about her career journey and her new memoir, Wake Me When You Leave, and how she overcame adversity and heartbreak and put herself on the pathway for healing. Elisa Donovan, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. You know, one of my favorite things just in general is when people make the conscious decision to be authentic in how they choose to share parts of themselves with the world, especially when they're already established public figures and there are already kind of preconceived notions and perceptions about who you are. And probably even based on the characters that you play, people think that they know you and who you are. Right. And when you kind of take back that, that power and you share, you know, this is who I am and this is part of my life, you really humanize yourself and you humanize and normalize your experience. And you've really done that with your memoir, Wake Me When You Leave. And it's extremely personal and you detail some really heart-wrenching back-to-back experiences that incurred in a very short period of time that really left you in a world of hurt. So just going back to that, what was that specific timeline in your life that was the impetus for writing this book? So over the course of a very short period of time, I, we were uh, shooting the series of Sabrina and I was in a relationship that I thought with that man I thought I was going to marry and my life just was completely making sense. And then very quickly, the show is canceled. My dad got cancer and mm-hmm. my relationship ended and all of those things happened uh, virtually at the same time. And wow. I went from thinking I knew what my life was about and <laughs> where, what my, my source of value and joy and income were. And it was just completely turned upside down. Uh, and that's what the book is about. That yeah. and coming back around the bend to, to understanding that these things are opportunities to to understand how you really want to live your life. Right. And, you know, a lot of people (laughs) wouldn't be able to even come out of that, you know, to be able to figure out how to deal with that. But how it did felt you, like for moments, it felt like I might not. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, that's a lot yeah. to, to put on one person. Right. And, you know, we always think, oh, everything happens for a reason. But sometimes you sit back and like, really? Like, is this yeah. all happening like, for a reason? It? Really? It <laughs> right. You really need to, couldn't the reason be a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy more. when you say that, but you figured out a way to kind of repurpose that pain, which I think is so beautiful. So what were steps that you took to kind of come out on the other side of all of that? Well, I think as a creative person, I feel really fortunate that I, any any difficulties or challenges in my life have always in some way or another been put into my creative process. And um, I've always been a writer. And I really felt like the only thing, I mean, I in, in the book, I talk about some auditions that I went on during this period of time where I just was checked out. You know, mm-hmm. I was not capable of you know, putting on this shiny, happy face, it was not what I could do. And, but the writing was always something that felt really pure to Mm -hmm. me. And it, it helped me to heal writing and music. Like if I could, (laughs) no one wants to hear me sing. I'll tell you that right now, (laughs) but if I could sing, you know, I think that would have been another, cause music is like a great uh, healer for me. Um, Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's not an expression that I'm very good at. I mean, I enjoy it, but again, no one wants to hear me sing. <laughs> but the, the writing was really like a part of the healing process for sure. Yeah. So just because I'm a musician, I'm a singer. So I'm curious, were there any specific songs that helped you get through that time? Oh, gosh. Well, there's every, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, I have a whole playlist that was, uh, um, that I wrote the book to, and there's a, I'm a huge Prince fan, oh, first yeah. of all. and he has this, this album called the truth. That's mm-hmm. essentially an acoustic record. And there is this song called come back. And it's the, the lyrics are, are essentially about, 
you know, when someone is gone, don't worry, they'll Mm. come back. They always come back. You know, we come back, they come back. And there is this um, connectivity that I felt. And then that and some other, you know, um, my dad was a big listener to uh, Ray Charles and Louis Armstrong. And so I had a whole jazz vibe. Um, And then uh, a lot of Prince, a lot of Coldplay. Some <laughs> I love uh, it. Very Black eclectic. Crows, Zeppelin. Yeah. <laughs> Good eclectic mix of music. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean music we, we know is a universal language and you can find any song to kind of get you through any emotion. So yes. that's cool. But Prince, that's 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 a really good pick. <laughs> Um, I w- he's amazing. I want to backtrack a little bit though, and go back to when your acting career started. Mm-hmm. And I know that you've been very open about having battled with having an eating disorder and you're currently a huge advocate for that and really a big support for other women and probably men as well that may have gone through that experience. So when you went into Hollywood, how much of the Hollywood culture did that affect you? I mean, I always, I'm very clear that I came, I showed up in Hollywood with that eating disorder. It yeah. did not give me one. Yeah. I think some people have a different story, but that's certainly my story. But I will say it was, it was endorsed. Mm-hmm. If not, it, people turned a blind eye to it because mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, something that was said a lot to me was, Oh, you're so skinny, but the clothes look great on you. Mm-hmm. You know, we can put anything on you. And, uh, you know, so again, it was more of an endorsement of something that I was already, very enmeshed in. Uh, so, you know, coming through that, that, that's another thing that I feel really passionate about uh, talking about because people need to understand that you really can recover and, uh, and lead a happy life and, and a full happy life. Mm-hmm. And, but it takes a tremendous amount of work. It doesn't just happen. It does yeah. not just happen. What was your journey to recovery? I I had a nutritionist. I went into the hospital, into the emergency, basically, because I mm-hmm. um, almost had a heart attack from not eating and uh, taking laxatives, which is a very deadly combination. And um, so in that moment was the beginning of my recovery, but... I, I, so I, I had a nutritionist, I had a psychiat- psychiatrist and a therapist, and all of those people helped me. And my gynecologist helped me. So I had kind of this whole team of people, but the main thing that really, uh, that really solidified my, my true recovery was coming, me coming to terms with what my life had become. And that the exterior was one thing, Mm -hmm. successful, great job in a big movie, but my insides were just hollow and I I was no longer a a creative person. I was showing up and playing this role, but I had no, I had no joy. I had nothing else in my life. And I went, wait a second, what is all this for? You know, what, what is all of this for? Who am I if I am just a person who goes to set, does a job, and then, you know, wanders around the grocery store looking for negative calorie foods? Like, what, is, yeah. what kind of an existence is that, you know? Right. And so I had to reclaim that I wanted to be a creative person, that I had a voice, that I am an, an individual whose voice needs to be heard in the world. Do you think that, because you said, and I think the way you worded it was very correct, but also beautifully stated, but that it was endorsed. Do you think that that type of culture is changing in the entertainment industry versus when when you were at the peak of of it, when you were doing Clueless and Sabrina? Mm, You know, I'd love to say yes, but I don't, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think we have a long, long way to go. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just re restructuring the whole narrative we can have the idea that it's just like oh are 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 women more valued in entertainment now oh yes female directors okay so there are two 
out of, you know, right. Out of hundreds, right. <laughs> you know, or, or black women in, in entertainment, uh, one show, you know, right. or, two, right. you know, so it's this thing of, we, we like to really applaud ourselves for doing one thing. Right. But it has to become a, a systemic shift. Yes. And I yes. think that's really similar with, with this, um, body, body, uh, image and, and, uh, that kind of thing, you know, we'd love to say that we celebrate all different sorts of bodies, but again, it's like a magazine cover. Oh, we celebrate this. And then that's it. Yeah. It's not really reflective in, in the films that we see or the shows that we see yet, yet. But yeah. I do think it's it is surface stuff. It's shifting. Cause at least you're not allowed to, you know, say it blatantly. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. And people aren't allowed to say, "Oh no, that's great. Keep losing weight." You know, like they—it's just that wouldn't be allowed. So I yeah. guess that's a shift. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we do we talk about the dark side of entertainment industry often. But what were the positives for you and the valuable lessons that you've learned as your career has grown? Oh, so many things. Because for one, I really look at entertainment in a way as as uh, as helping me to recover. Because I felt mm. like I was afraid. Oh, I'm going to lose my job. Right. If I'm in a hospital and or I'm passing out on set, I'm not going to have a job. Yeah. So initially, I, I I look at it as though it helped me to to kind of stay on the path to recovery. But that's certainly not a um, a recipe for long term recovery. But it helped me to to get a leg up on things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, and the other part of it is really understanding that. Who I am as an individual is the best asset that I have. Mm. There is not one other person on this earth who is me. Yeah. And what I offer creatively in my 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 insides, my intellect, yes, my physical appearance, the whole picture, my spiritual life, I'm the only person who offers that. And I think that is true of every single person. So when you choose to get into entertainment, if, if, or if it chooses you and it's what your calling is, if we look at these great, these, you know, these artists that have made an imprint on society, it's not like there are 700 of them that they, we've duplicated, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's these very individual people that have individual gifts. And so that's what I really uh, cling to now. And I really look at it like what I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If there's a role that's meant for me, it's meant for me. Yeah. And my job is to just show up and do the best I can and, mm-hmm. you know, not get my own way. Uh, but but really that's, there are things we're meant to do and, and, uh, and don't try to be somebody else. I guess That's a beautiful sentiment because I think it's the opposite of what people think. They do think they have to try to act, be like this actor or be like this singer or be like this person because they made it. So it's okay. Let me shift my entire existence to just kind of emulate this person. And it's like, no, you're unique for a reason. And somebody will buy into what you're selling for sure. Yes, 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 yes. That is so true. And that, that's that, that, you know, secret sauce that is not so secret is just to truly be who you are yeah which sounds so simple and so trite but it's it's the truth (laughs) but it's hard actually Mm -hmm. it is hard hard. because we are fed these ideals that we have to change who we are for someone to like us right and we want yes and we want to succeed and we want to be liked so it's almost especially as women there are these unconscious things that we do and I, I really was, became aware of it, you know, later in life, in my twenties, I, I think I, I knew I was doing it, but I was incapable of not doing it, you know, like sort of shifting in a situation or trying to make myself look easy and appealing and, and, you know, just bright and easy to deal with. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's just, it, it, it doesn't work to try to be something else. Right. And it's hard as women, we are taught from such a young age, people say things like, oh, she's so cute. She's so pretty. She's so that, you know, we're valued for this very congenial um, outward thing, mm-hmm. which is, uh, it's just a confusing messaging. I think. It is. 
And then, of course, going into entertainment, it just gets kind of exasperated. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, with all that you've been through, though, you know, what would you say to somebody that feels like maybe everything is crumbling around them on about how to get on the other side of it? Mm, I, the biggest thing I can say is acknowledge that mm. things are crumbling. Mm. Acknowledge the crumble. <laughs> because you know the 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 more you try to evade it or the more you try to to you know go underneath it or above it or behind it or around it it just gets it it, it, it that's when it really starts to swallow you whole and i think that's the um the greatest lesson that i got once i actually just said oh i can't run from this anymore like i don't have a direction to run i can't hide in a relationship i can't hide in my job i can't yeah. hide in my family i went oh i just have to sit with this that's it and i remember feeling as though if i sit with this i will die mm. I, it will swallow me whole mm. but what really wound up happening was that it was the opposite it helped me to start the road to recovery to slowly start to put one foot in front of the other and say, yeah, uh, things are pretty bad. Mm. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. And then that's how we uh, learn to help ourselves and, 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 and learn who we, who we want to, to spend our time with and how yeah. we want to spend our time. Yeah. Are there any, specific practices that you incorporate into your everyday or just your lifestyle in general that have helped you stay healthy physically and mentally? I started doing yoga while this was all happening. And mm. prior to that, um, I've always been a, you know, a person who exercises and stays fit, et cetera. But, and uh, I never, People would say to me, oh, you should try yoga because you're, you know, and I would always say, I don't have the patience for yoga. I'm not, <laughs> this is not going to work for me. I'm not into it. And I was so just flattened by everything. I took a yoga class and I just cried through the entire class, like uh -huh. the snots, like coming out of my nose. <laughs> and I started to, I began a yoga practice that turned into I practice for, I mean, pre pandemic, I would practice four to five days a week of vinyasa yoga. And mm. it's been incredibly healing for me physically and spiritually. And, um, so that is definitely something that, that I, that I still do. Um, that's really a part of my, uh, of my sanity for sure. Yeah, that's important. It's very important to find those things because even like you mentioned, even if you don't acknowledge the crumble, it's going to get worse. If you don't do something to take care of yourself, it will also yes. get worse. So that's great yes. that you found that. Yes. Yeah. You talked about in your book, how you felt like you were getting messages from mm. your dad. And I fully believe in that. Like I'm seriously, truly believe that it's definitely, it's hard to explain, but I've definitely felt like I've gotten messages from people in my life that I've been close to that have passed on. But how was it confirmed for you that it was definitely your dad reaching out and watching over you and just kind of letting you know everything was going to be okay? So the, 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 the first things that were really, really clear to me I, I had a dream where my dad came to me in this dream, which I talk about a, a couple of them in the book, but the first one in particular, it was so uh, different from any other dream, meaning it, it was like an actual visitation. So I, I, I went, I felt as though I was told to go to sleep and it was in one of these periods of time where I just, I couldn't sleep. I was depressed. It was at the, the the beginning and sort of height of all of this. And I just, I just looked up at the sky at night and I just said, somebody help, like, you've got to help me. I cannot sleep. Like I'm starting to lose my mind, I think, because I'm not sleeping and I, I am really spiraling. And I felt this, this, presence just tell me to, to go to sleep and I lay down in my bed and I went to sleep and in this dream my father was he, I, it's it's as though I felt very lucid more lucid than I've ever been in a dream before and he sat with me in this boat 
And he, we spoke to each other. His mouth didn't move, but I heard mm. the sound of his voice and we communicated in this very pure way. And he told me that he was trying to, he was trying to make sense of where he was, which was totally re- revelatory to me. I felt like, oh, great, he's here. He's going to help me. And he was kind of saying, I don't know what's going on here, yeah. where I am, <laughs> you know? And I went, oh, no. Uh, but uh, so the dreams were incredibly, and there's the hummingbird. I was going to say, there's always, now what happens is, I, whenever I'm talking about my dad, the, a hummingbird comes by. So this hummingbird is right in my little tree outside oh, my wow. window again. Um, and In the beginning, it was always in these moments of real um, desperation, you know, a feeling of, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this one. Mm. And then, you know, a Ray Charles song will come on the radio on a pop music station, you know, something (laughs) where Where you normally wouldn't be there. Yeah, correct. Yes. And so those kinds of things would happen all the time. And now they happen because I'm not in that, you know, deep dark place they usually come when it's like uh he just wants to say hello or like support what i'm doing or and it happens all the time i find that once we're open to them um those messages come through a lot that's incredible i yeah and my my mom has had similar experiences with her grandmother who she was very very close to where she just felt like she's even felt a hand on the shoulder yes, yes. or just like a, a like a breeze that like you just yes. feel the presence of how they were when they were here you feel it and yes. I, I i fully believe it like i said and i think it's so comforting it's, it's so very, so comforting it has happened to me i write about this in the book it happened to it's happened to me while i've been driving Hmm. And where to the point where I felt like I'm in a car by myself, but I feel as though someone is sitting in the passenger seat, like there's someone sitting there so much so that I would be (laughs) almost afraid to look to my right. Right. Is there going to be somebody? (laughs) Is this going to, am I going to drive off the road? Like what is happening here? And it is just a, a presence that is, it's stronger than a physical presence. Mm-hmm. It's just this all encompassing kind of a knowingness and mm-hmm. a sensation that's incredibly comforting because it, it's, it's like this very pure, pure sensation um, that, that has, has really brought me great comfort. Yeah. You know, with, we talked about before, you know, we joked about, you know, everything happens for a reason, but sometimes it seems a little crazy. (laughs) But why do you think that you needed to go through all that you've gone through at this point in your life when you're looking back and you're like, ah, I see what, what the lesson was or why I had to experience all of this? I think... I don't know how to say this without sounding uh, crazy, but I suppose at this point, I'm always going <laughs> to either going to be crazy or, or not. Um, I had someone do my astrological chart. I've had that done in the past years mm-hmm, ago. Mm-hmm. And someone did it recently, about a year ago. Just, uh, well, let's see. Yes, just over a year ago. And it was right before the the deal was signed for the book, et cetera. Or sorry, right, right uh, after. And he essentially told me what my soul's purpose is by my chart Hmm. that your soul's purpose is for you to communicate your, how did he, how did he word it? He said to communicate the challenges of your emotional life within your family in order to heal yourself and other people. Wow. And I went, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> so, well, I have this book coming out that's about, and he was like, oh my God, oh my God, what? And I said, yeah, he's like, well, you're, you're on the right track. Wow. So I get, and there's a, a film in development based on the book. And so I think that's the short answer that it's my soul's purpose. And maybe I wasn't, I don't know how else I could get here without having gone through those things. Wow. How affirming is that? You oh, probably have chills. You, I have chills hearing it. <laughs> I tell you, I had chills too. I wow. went, oh, wow. Because when something takes a long time, you know, this, this book and the film have been, they've been, you know, I've been nurturing them for all uh, years now. And mm-hmm. 
these, these, these projects and these things that are so meaningful to us that I, I believe are meant to be accomplished and put into the world, they, yeah. they take their own time. And yes. It's often not on our timeline. So to get that kind of affirmation after all this time felt like, oh, this is, this is a beautiful thing. It's nice know? to know when you're on the right path you know yes. it's like that moment of clarity like ah oh, it all makes sense now it's meant yes. to come to this point that's amazing yes. that's really yes. incredible so I know you had said that there is a film in development mm -hmm. um, and you're directing it correct yes why yes. did you decide to to want to direct this well I have one always wanted to direct and I'm the kind of actor that is very uh, busy in that way of mm -hmm. going well, why did they shoot it you know I've got the whole story in my mind and then I right. see it and say well, that's not at all the way I would have told this story. Right, <laughs> right, right. Um, so uh, I really felt like this was, number one, not something that I want to be in because I think someone else needs to bring their own insight into mm. playing the character that's essentially me. Um, but I, to direct it, I, I so know how to tell this story. Yeah. I, I, I see it visually. I hear it. I hear the music. I just, I know that I am meant to direct this project and I feel really prepared and really excited to do that. And, um, you know, the people that are coming on board are all people that say, I want to be a part of this. I believe in what this project is and I, 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 I want to be involved and it's, it's really an affirming kind of thing. And then, yeah. you know, I don't want to act. The first thing that I direct, I certainly do not want to be acting in it too. I, I mean, I think I'm going to need a little, I don't know if I want to wear those hats at the same oh, time. Yeah, right. The first right. time out. Uh, <laughs> I get that. That would be a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But so that's I so exciting. Wanna, yeah, I just want to focus on the directing part of it. <laughs> that's wonderful. So when you decided to write this book and share your story and share your experience with the world, was there a pivotal moment in your life when you made that decision, when you were like, you know what, I need to write this all down? I, I've always been a writer, so mm -hmm. I've always kept extensive journals. I've always written autobiographical fiction. I was had a, a minor in writing in college. Like, so it's something that's definitely been in my, a part of my world forever. Um, and in the beginning, the first couple of months, I couldn't write anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't read anything. I didn't write anything. And I also didn't listen to music. Those first, you know, he talked about how important music is. Yeah. I, those first couple of months, I just, it was like a white noise of silence because music, I couldn't, I didn't want to, I couldn't feel joyful. And if it was painful music, I couldn't go, it was too painful. And I just felt like I was in this silent space. And then slowly I just started writing and I started writing. It was too painful to write about my own experience and I kept thinking about my mom and I kept thinking, if I am having such a hard time having lost my dad, like how is she functioning mm. when they were married for almost 50 years Wow! and she doesn't know life without my dad, except for living with her parents. And so I kind of started to scratch away from, um, you know, through her, her uh, standpoint at first and then I just started to really write about the dark place that I was in. Yeah. And it helped me start to come out. So, and I think I wanted to write it as a book back then. And I didn't have a lot of support for that, mm. um, you know, professionally, because it was this idea, well, you're an actress, like, wait, you're not, oh, you're going to pretend that you know how to write a book. And, <laughs> you know, and I was always like, I am a writer. I've always been a writer. I know you might think that I do one thing, but I actually do a couple things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's those, it's like I said in the beginning, it's those preconceived yeah. notions, those perceptions yes. of who you and are. People, yeah. So you have an idea when I first was pitching the book, 
I was blessed to get a, a book agent through a, a, another uh, author, a friend of mine. And so the book agent read it and said, this is beautiful. You know, I only had a few chapters. And so she wanted to represent the book. But anytime she tried to pitch it, people assumed, oh, the girl from Clueless is writing a book like about being in Clueless. Like, we don't care about that book and I said I don't care about that book I'm not writing that book <laughs> no <laughs> I don't somebody let you know let Julia Roberts write about uh you know acting in Aaron Brockovich like right. I don't, no, no, this is not what I'm doing and she had a real hard time getting people to wrap their heads around the idea that this is not about my career in film and that you actually had something to say yes yeah. yes and that I didn't have a ghostwriter. it's not like oh this is my idea and someone else wrote it for me, you know, it was really hard for people to wrap their heads around that. So I think that also that time probably needed to pass for people mm. to kind of forget and then, you know, allow me to emerge as my own person. Yeah. It's just, it's a shame that it feels like at any point in your life, in your career, not just you, just in general, in general. you're always having to prove yourself, you know? Yes. Yes. And you're like, really? That, like, <laughs> right. I do also think that that is partly not to, I kind of get crazy when people make things too gender oriented, but I do think there is a, there's a big onus on women to prove ourselves. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And, uh, I hope that that shifts, you know, that's something yeah. that we are responsible for individually too, to yeah. not subscribe to that you know? Um, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It is. And for, yeah. yeah, there's some, there's this thought process that the investment may not be worth it for some reason. Right. Like what, what, where, what, where does that come from? I have from? no idea where that comes from. Because <laughs> no. there, I mean, women are incredible. We've done amazing things. We content in books in movies. And so yes. it's like, what more do you need to see? <laughs> right. Who is exactly how many ways do I need to approve this oh man I mean, it's funny you you get known for you know thinking about clueless people i was typecast from the beginning and i thought wait is it the point aren't actors isn't our job that we become other people yeah not that like i'm not a beverly hills teenager <laughs> you know that's actually not <laughs> who i am i just happen to <laughs> play this part really well right. and i can play other parts really well too you yeah know? but it's the it's it's interesting it's like the blessing and the curse of doing something that is successful and then you get pigeonholed for that for the rest yeah, of your sometimes life almost. They just want you to keep doing the same thing and sometimes that's great but you know sometimes you also have other other things to do. You contain multitudes. Yes. That's exactly that what it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you this before we wrap up, because you have, you know, experienced a lot of adversity and heartbreak, but what, and this is different for everybody, but what has healing looked like for you? What does that mean for you? That's such a great question. It means a couple things. One, being unafraid to to look the to look the challenge in the face, like to not have you know that feeling that we have when something is still like stuck in your grill, and it can be like a person or a memory of a situation, and you think about it, and you get that jolt through your body that's like oh, I, uh, and it's yeah. almost like a fight or flight. Or you're immediately going, and another thing I mm -hmm. want to say, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So to me, healing is not is no longer having that that these things as a trigger or a reactionary experience. Mm. Right. It is actually going, yeah, that's a part of my story. Yeah. It's part of my 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 life and my story. Um, so that's a big part of it, I would say. And also yeah, incorporating incorporating it into into the the fabric of who I am because I'm a big believer in that. That it isn't just oh we went through this and then I put it aside. You know, I, I always liken it to playing different characters. So you you know hopefully uh, I, if I get in get cast in something, I do my research on the role, I figure out who this person is, what they want, I do all the work so to speak. And then you show up on set 
and you have to let that, you let it go. You know that you've, you've done the work, you're here. And then I just take everything, you know, I call it like everything is in, right? No matter what happens, somebody says something weird to me on the set, that's in, you know, I take yeah. it in. It's, it's yeah. like going to be, it's going to inform what happens here. So I think that's another part of, of uh, healing for me in a general sense. That's beautiful. Lisa, it was wonderful chatting with you. Can you let everyone know where they can get your book? Oh, yes. They can get my book on my website, elisa-donovan.com. They can get it on Amazon. They can get it at Barnes & Noble, on Goodreads. Basically, any place you buy books, you can get it. And the audiobook will be out I'm not sure when, but soon, because I'm recording it shortly. So it should be out certainly by the fall, I think. Wonderful. And following you on social media as well? Yes. On Instagram, I am Red Donovan. Red Donovan on Twitter and Facebook is Elisa Donovan with everything with the little blue check. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I loved it. Oh, thank you. And to the listeners, make sure you subscribe to We Need to Talk and we'll talk to you again real soon. Bye. Bye.